Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV. I'm Andrew Sumner. And uh, today we are privileged to be joined by the one and only Marissa Meyer. How are you, Marissa? I am fabulous. How are you today? Really well, thank you. Really well. Despite the rain in the Pacific Northwest and the rain in the UK, <laughs> I feel very happy. And I feel very connected to you. We could be talking to each other in the same place. <laughs> one thousand percent. Yeah, that's what you get. We're, we're, yes, exactly. It's the the, uh, the 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 international union of the climate. That's what it is. Yes. Right? <laughs> Whatever parallel that is, I don't know what the number is, but it's certainly the thing either. that connects, connects you to the UK, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> now, you, of course, you're a massive favourite of uh, Forbidden Planet as a result of your superlative Lunar Chronicles. Uh, but we're here to talk about uh, your latest um, unusual deep dive into the mythos of fairy tale with Gilded. So what can you tell me about Gilded, Marissa? So yes, yeah, so this is my return to fairy tale retellings, which I haven't done since the Lunar Chronicles wrapped up. And Gilded is a retelling of Rumpelstiltskin. Um, and it is the story of a girl named Cyrilda. She is the daughter of a miller. And before she was born, she was cursed by the god of lies. Um, and that curse has made her into this girl who is a liar can't really help herself all the time, uh, but she is also an incredible storyteller. Well, one day this uh, gift of hers, gift slash curse, gets her in trouble when she meets the wicked Earl King, who is the leader of the wild hunt. And she crosses paths with him. And in their conversation, she happens to tell him that she is capable of spinning straw into gold. Uh, well, not long after that, she finds herself whisked away to the Earl King's haunted castle, which is full of ghosts and monsters and things that would like to kill her. Uh, and she is told that she must spin straw into gold. She can't do it, but there is a handsome and mischievous poltergeist who lives in the castle who can. And so he agrees to help her. Uh, but in this world, all magic comes at a cost. And that sets us off on our adventure. Brilliant, brilliant. And I, to to take a step back to when when you you be, you began your unique retellings of fairy tales, what is it that uh, what is it that was the spur to do that? What drew what drew you to that form? Yeah, I have loved fairy tales since I was a little kid. Um, of course, at a very young age, I was raised on Disney, as of course, so of many of us are. And when I was, I think, five years old, Disney's The Little Mermaid came out and I became just obsessed with this movie. I, I loved it. I knew all the words, could sing all the songs. My grandma heard that I was such a big fan of this. And so she gave me a little book of fairy tales. And the first story in that book was The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen. And of course, people who are familiar with the tale probably know that five-year-old Marissa was not so pleased <laughs> with this version <laughs> yeah, of the story. Right I, yeah. <laughs> uh, I was, I was just so taken aback to see what the, the true story was. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that kind of launched me on this path of, I would say, curiosity to know, you know, what else is Disney keeping from me? Clearly I am missing some things. And I started reading the, the Grimm's fairy tales and then eventually wanted to branch out into more folk tales from around the world. And it's just kind of become this lifelong interest of mine. Yeah. I, I mean, I think you've really hit the nail on the head. Uh, and uh, it was the next place I was going to go if your answer had been different is just that huge difference between the Disney-fied and worldwide popular now in the 21st century versions of these fairy tales versus the original actual source material. And what a huge difference there is in tone and approach uh, and the effect it has upon you when, when you engage with those stories versus those, those filmic versions and the actual raw source material. I yeah, think, I think, as, as that as, uh, as the power of that is that is that something that you've tried to embrace within your work? Would you say it is? I mean, one of the things that draws me to fairy tales, and I think draws a lot of people to fairy tales, is that they they are so universal, um, and they they have these themes and these messages that we are drawn to 
over and over and over again. And it doesn't matter what time period you're from. It doesn't matter where in the world you're from, what culture, what background. There are things in these stories that are just so iconic on a really deep human level. Uh, and one of the things that I love as a creator is that, you know, you can take the story of Rumpelstiltskin or the story of Cinderella and give it to a hundred different writers or artists, and you're going to get a hundred different interpretations of it. Uh, and it, there's, there's something about these stories that we can keep the familiar familiarity, you know, keep the same kind of heart of the story and yet put our own twists and our own spins on them. And as a creative, you know, type, that's, I think one of the, the most fun things for me is to see how can I take this story and how can I make it my own? Yeah, no, I, I, I get that. I, I would have thought that Gilded particularly, that the story of Rumpelstiltskin is really such an interesting uh, fairy tale to engage with. I, I, and I, to my knowledge, I don't think it's ever really been Disney-fied and I would always assume that's because it's so dark in the first place, it's almost <laughs> impossible to take that story and give it the all singing, all dancing treatment. I mean, it's more of a, you'd expect it. It's, it's more in keeping with, say, Tim Burton than classic Disney, right? Um, but were there, were there any particular challenges with that particular story where you were like, oh man, I've got, I've got to, I, I can't use, I can't use this. I've got to change it in some way. Yeah, there were a number of challenges uh, and things that I didn't really expect when I first decided to retell this story. Uh, one of the first things was that I knew that I wanted to change the, the idea of who is the villain and who is the love interest. Of course, in the original tale, she ends up marrying the king and we're expected to believe that Rumpelstiltskin is the bad guy. And that never sat well with me. Um, the king is this guy that has repeatedly threatened to kill this poor girl over and over if she can't do this you know, impossible thing. And I just couldn't buy that, you know, oh, she's gonna marry him and now happily ever after. Uh, so I knew that I was going to be turning the king into the villain of the story and that therefore Rumpelstiltskin was going to become the love interest. And that was really fun for me to play with, but it definitely changed a lot of, you know, what the story is about and kind of how we're the lens that we're looking at it through. Uh, and then probably the biggest challenge is that in the fairy tale, you know, you have this sequence of events, you know, the king is told she can spin straw into gold. She comes back to the castle for three nights. Rumpelstiltskin helps her. She marries the king. Bam, fast forward nine months later and suddenly she has a baby. Uh, well, you can't really do that. I mean, I guess you could, but I knew that that wasn't gonna work for me, that I had to do something with those nine months. I needed to find a way to fill in that story time. And the fairy tale gives absolutely no guidance there, uh, which is both a, a challenge, but also part of the fun for me to now think, okay, what are, what is, what is happening in this story and what can I do with that? Yeah, oh, amazing. I, um, I, I really, I really can't wait to actually read it myself, I have to say. Uh, and uh, I, I guess you've now done, it's, is it five big fairy tales? Because you've got Cinderella, Snow White, Rumpelstiltskin, um, Rapunzel. Little Red Riding Hood Little and Red Rapunzel. Riding Hood. Yes. And I also did Alice in Wonderland, which, you know, some people yes, think it's a fairy tale and some don't. So, yeah, so do, you, do you have, are there any, are there any other tales out there that you would like to get hold of in the future? Many. I have a long list of fairy tales that I would love to, uh, you know, take on at some point. Uh, nothing currently in the works. I'm still working on book two of Gilded, the sequel. Um, but I, you know, I've always been drawn to Bluebeard, which is another oh, very wow. dark yeah. story. That's a very uh, interesting one. story. Yes, it's very interesting. And I think that a lot, you could do a lot with it. I think it'd be a really fun one to work with. Um, another personal favorite is a Norwegian tale called East of the Sun, West of the Moon. Um, and that is Actually, many, many years ago, I started writing a retelling for that fairy tale, um, pre-Lunar Chronicles even, and ended up putting it on the shelf, uh, but it's one that's always kind of called to me. So maybe I'll return to it at some point. Oh yeah, that, that, would, be, that would be awesome. I think getting hold of Bluebeard would be fascinating. If I yes. remember correctly, there's quite an obscure it's quite an obscure 60s or 70s film that stars Richard Burton, I think, which is an adaptation of Bluebeard. 
and uh, I remember it really freaking me out when I was a kid on late night TV. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> Yeah, it really is quite a grisly tale, but I think I think you'd be per- I think you'd be perfect for that. Your your se- your your second volume of Gilded. Do you have a title for that yet, Marissa? I do, but we haven't announced it. You can't yet. share it with me. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, I hear this a lot, and I, I totally understand. Yes. <laughs> but the other thing I thought uh, is that in all the editions I've seen, um, you must be really pleased with the covers that you've got on the novel because they look so beautiful. I do. No, I I absolutely love it. The design team, um, both here in America and in England, are just fantastic. And I love this cover, how it just pops with all the gold. It's been really beautiful. Yeah, right on. I mean, and, and, and that beautiful UK edition of Gilded is what Marissa and I have been talking about. And everybody watching this conversation can buy it from the links attached right here on YouTube. Thanks so much for joining me, Marissa. It's been wonderful chatting with you. Oh, my absolute pleasure. It's been so great to talk to you too. Take care of yourself. Cheerio. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.